So for those of you joining us live on the Zoom webinar, welcome everyone. For those of you joining live on the YouTube live stream, thank you for joining us as well. I do want to do a little shout out to, um, to Mr. M and his students at the Girls Academic Leadership Academy in California. I believe they're joining us via the YouTube live stream. So welcome to the Girls Academic Leadership Academy again in California. And also Miss O and her students from Campbell Middle School in Georgia. I know for a fact they're joining us on the YouTube live stream as well as I think Miss D and Downs Elementary in Delaware as well. So we wanna welcome all of you. We've actually got participants from 37 states Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, Brazil, Canada, Chile, India, Mexico, and the Philippines. Those are the registrations that we have received for our event today. And we're connecting with students in grades two all the way up through adults. So we've got quite a mix out there, and we're so glad that you're joining us. My name is Paige Graff. I'm the lead facilitator for our webinar today. But I want to take a moment to welcome our featured speaker, Kent Fisher, who is going to introduce himself momentarily so you can learn a little bit about him before he starts sharing this great content. But also on the line are other experts, including Andrea Mito and Laura Phoebus. They're also scientists as part of our earth science and remote sensing team. And they will be answering questions in the Q&A area if you're on the Zoom webinar and also perhaps responding to your chats. So um, the one thing I just wanted to show is this is a map that shows where all of you are. So those of you that registered for the live event, you're in blue. So we've got the United States pretty well covered with those 37 states. Uh, and those that registered for the archive are in sort of that goldenrod color. So welcome to all of you. I'm going to stop sharing my camera and my presentation and turn things over to Kent. So Kent, over to you. Thank you, Paige. Let me pull up my presentation. All right, can you guys see that? Yes, we can. All right, thanks. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenton Fisher, or Kent for short. Um, and I'm talking to you from Houston, Texas, which is the location of NASA's Johnson Space Center. Um, for those unaware, Johnson Space Center is the home of NASA's Human Space Flight Program and is where all astronauts that have traveled uh, on NASA missions have trained uh, before their mission and where they come to after they come back from their mission to debrief and prepare for future missions. Uh, as Paige said in the introduction, um, please feel free if you're on the Zoom link to use the question and answer function. Uh, I'm gonna go through a lot of content today and I wanna hear your questions, but I can't stop and answer a question every single time we get one because we're gonna have a lot. And so that's why we've got Andrea and Laura and everyone else on the call to help answer questions through that tool. And so feel free to shoot them off at any time they come up and they'll try to answer them to the best of their ability. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, I will uh, be staying around for uh, about 15 minutes for a question and answer session also, so I can answer anything that didn't get to uh, be answered through that tool or came up later in the talk. Um, and so, with that, I'm going to get started. And, and today, you know, I'm here to talk to you about observing Earth from space uh, with astronaut photography. And uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the idea of remote sensing, but that's generally the idea is that you know, you're looking at the Earth from something in space, whether it's a satellite or from, in this case, a, uh, the space station, and from images from the astronauts. And so uh, everything you'll see here, all the images that are included, except for the one picture of me, uh, are from the space station or from previous NASA missions. And they were all taken by astronauts with handheld cameras. So why are we here today? Uh, we're here because next week on the 22nd is Earth Day. And uh, for those of you not familiar with Earth Day, it's been around since 1970. It was founded by a gentleman named John McConnell, uh, an environmental activist. And it's a, a annual international event, I wouldn't call it a holiday, but more of a, a, a outreach event to uh, focus on promoting and celebrating uh, environmental protection and nature and the planet. And the kind of core belief and core tenet of Earth Day is to uh, try to unite not just Americans, not just uh, you know, us and our local families, but the whole international community to pursue um, the environmental protections needed to uh, keep our planet healthy and keep it a great place for us to live and save it in a, 
and keep it in a good condition for not just our generation or the next generation, but the generations down the line. And so a lot of this stuff we're talking about today, right, has to do with astronauts and how we view the Earth. Uh, but I want to make sure that, you know, one core fundamental um, message that you take home with yourself today from this talk is that, uh, you know, things like the International Space Station uh, exist for us to research how to better live on Earth and better live in space. And we can't live on Earth unless we take care of the planet, right? And we, so we need to focus on things like environmental protection and uh, how we can mitigate the effects of climate change so that we can continue living in this, this beautiful place. And so there's always things that I'm gonna talk about at the very end of this talk um, that you can do in your own personal life uh, you know, to help with uh, environmental protection. It seems like such a big topic, something that's too, too much for me as an individual to really contribute to. Um, but I'm going to give you some ideas at the end on how you can uh, contribute to that. And just remember that, you know, all these beautiful pictures we have of Earth are not possible unless we have a beautiful planet to look at. And so we need to take care of it. And so uh, I'm going to walk through a, a brief history of astronaut photography, um, what makes it uh, unique and useful. And I'm going to pose you guys a couple questions about why you think it's useful and unique. Um, and then I'm going to highlight some ways that the research that we're doing with these images are helping us monitor the effects of climate change. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about you know, what we can do um, to change our personal habits to, you know, help uh, protect the environment and how the, the imagery that we have from the space station is, is helping in that uh, cause. And so this picture on the right, um, first one we'll look at is a very famous photo. I'm positive almost all of you have seen it. It's one of the most reproduced photos in human history, one of the most printed photos in human history. You can see Africa there with the Arabian Peninsula right off the top, Madagascar in the middle. And this photo is famously known as the Blue Marble. And it was taken on the Apollo 17 mission as the astronauts were on their way to the moon and looking back towards the Earth, they snapped this photo back in uh, the late 60s or maybe early 70s, I can't remember exactly. And it became a huge international hit because it's an important um, image in that it captures the essence of planet Earth and us and all of the you know sort of research and, and collaboration that we do. If you think about Every single person I've known, every single person you've known, every plant you've seen, every animal you've seen, everywhere you've ever been is in that picture on that planet. That's, that's all we have, right? That's, that's where we live and that's what we need to take care of. And it's all encompassed in that one image. And so it really highlights the importance of taking care of the planet. And also there's a fun fact, um, John McConnell, the founder of Earth Day, the flag he created for Earth Day in 1970 uses this picture as the flag um, with a blue background. And so it really puts connection between Earth Day and astronaut imagery. So before I jump into astronaut imagery, I wanna give you a quick background about myself. I am uh, working at NASA's Johnson Space Center as an engineer currently and a scientist. Uh, I was born and raised in Ohio, Columbus, go Buckeyes, go Bearcats. Um, I studied uh, engineering for my bachelor's and master's degrees. Uh, and I joined NASA through a thing called the Pathways Intern Program. If you are a kid out there interested in working at NASA, I highly recommend looking up the Pathways Intern Program. It is the number one way NASA hires um, students just out of college to come work for NASA on really cool projects um, and help you know, progress the cause of NASA and space exploration. Uh, in my free time, I like doing things like hiking. As I see this picture here on the right is me from the Narrows in uh, Zion National Park. Um, but I don't have much free time right now because uh, outside of work, I'm a full-time PhD student also uh, studying the effects of climate change on the Texas coast and the Gulf of Mexico. And so I'm working both as an engineer and as a, as a researcher uh, in earth sciences. Within NASA, I've worked uh, on studying meteorites with published research on uh, meteorites from Mexico, the IND meteorite. I've also worked on multiple experiments to the International Space Station. Uh, one called the Space Debris Spencer, looking for orbital debris. Another one called Hermes, monitoring um, asteroid particles in microgravity, and which just came down. And also, I am uh, the lead for the ISS Crew Earth Observations Facility, which is just a big fancy term for all of the astronaut photography that we take. Uh, and so our group uh, here at Johnson Space Center, the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Group, which is the group that I, I run and Andrea is a part of and Laura is a part of, uh, we manage this crew Earth observations facility, and the, we do everything from training astronauts on how to take pictures, telling them what places we want pictures of, how to take those pictures, and then when they get pictures, managing all that, sending it out to the researchers, and hosting it publicly online for you and anyone in the public to view and download the full resolution copies. And so there's a link at the bottom there, but I have another slide at the very end that talks about that. We also... Um, 
don't just manage the International Space Station imagery, and I'm going to get to it on the next slide here. We talk about uh, past missions, and we manage past imagery from past missions, all the way back to some of the first human spaceflight uh, missions from NASA, including Mercury Program, Apollo, and, and so forth. And so we've got a large collection available to the public for free, no cost, all high resolution, um, along with the stuff that we provide for research. So we, in our group here at Johnson Space Center, you know, as I said, we don't just have the astronauts take photos of, of Earth, right? We do a lot of things related to it. It's much more uh, of a broad uh, uh, role than just, you know, the pictures they take of Earth. Uh, we provide support to the ISS program, which is on the left. And uh, when I say ISS for the rest of the presentation, that stands for the International Space Station. And that's the space station that we have uh, orbiting Earth right now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it uh, in the future. But the, we support the ISS program. There are a lot of, uh, outside of just training astronauts, there are a lot of payloads on the outside that are uh, different things, that, sensors that they're trying to use to look at the surface of Earth and monitor different things like vegetation or moisture or lightning. And our group has uh, the longest continuous uh, experience doing remote sensing from the space station. And so we provide a lot of expertise to those groups as they're in their planning phases and, and preparing their experiments. And additionally, we manage all the imagery requests. And so, you know, I don't just sit there and decide, hey, I want a picture of this place or, you know, any of our team doesn't say, we just want a picture of that place. Uh, we actually take requests from the research community and from scientists and from education uh, groups for requests of what they need uh, information for or data for um, from our images so that we can provide the best product to them. And so we have a tool set up so that a scientist can sit there and say, I need a picture of this part of Florida and they could tell us why and what research they're doing. And it comes to us and we evaluate and make sure it's a legitimate uh, request. You know, we get asked, can we take a picture of someone's house? That's not something that we can do. But if you have a research request, we can we can do that. And we process it and then we turn it into, from a small request by a researcher into all the, the stuff needed to be able to tell an astronaut on the space station, we need this photo for this reason. In addition, we do a lot of disaster response. And this is something not many folks realize with the International Space Station program is that we do uh, support disaster response on Earth in real time. And so uh, on the right is a photo from the California wildfires a couple years back. And uh, this is an example of the type of images we provide for disaster response. Uh, the United States is a signatory to the International Disaster Charter. And that is an international treaty of different countries that have signed on to provide data to countries that need it during disasters. Things like hurricanes, wildfires, earthquakes, you name it. Uh, and as part of that process, we have a, a, a fast uh, setup so that we can, when a disaster happens, we can instantly request imagery from an astronaut. And if they're able to, they can collect images for us. And we turn around and send it directly to the people who need it on the ground. The, uh, the best, you know, we can do everything from wildfires like this. We even have images from the Suez Canal that got blocked uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, we can get images of a lot of things from, from the space station. On top of that, we do a lot of uh, outreach events similar to this one uh, and things like reading, writing uh, weekly articles. And so on the left, you see a weekly article uh, from a thing called Earth Observatory, which we'll mention later on. And so these are images that we find that are really beautiful. We write a small article about it and then pu it's published online for the public to view and learn about what's happening uh, with our imagery. In addition, we do something called machine learning, which is just a fancy term for we train computers to how to identify things in images. And so, for example, this is an image of a city at night, and we have a model set up that we give images of cities at night, and we tell the computer, this is a picture of Paris, this is a picture of Paris, this is a picture of Paris. And then they can the computer can start taking more pictures in that are not labeled and say, this looks like Paris, and say, this is a picture of Paris with a really high percent um, confidence. And so we do a lot of research in that realm to help improve our database. On top of that, mentioning the database, we manage the, the photo database of all the images, of the many millions of images that astronauts have taken over uh, and continue to take um, so that they're all publicly available and easy to access. So going on the history I was mentioning, you know, we curate over 4 million photos um, taken by astronauts since the early days of space travel and, and exploration. Um, including the Mercury missions, Apollo, the space shuttle. Uh, they took a lot of, uh, we took a lot of images from the space shuttle. And then of course the International Space Station since 2000. So just over 20, 000, or 20 years that we've been imaging continuously from the space station. And so I have a question for you, which is out of the 4 million photos we've taken, how many do you think have been taken from the International Space Station? And you can use your chat function. 
Awesome. For, and for those of you that might be watching the live stream, discuss your potential answers uh, to see what you come up with. For those of you that are um, watching the archive, you might pause, discuss, and then restart the webinar to see what kinds of answers you're getting. So again, as you put in answers, if you start with your school or org name, that will help me give some shout outs uh, to many of you. So it looks like we've got some answers coming in. Some folks are saying three and a half million, another three million, another solar system ambassador says about half. Sanborn Central and the sixth graders say they think two and a half million photos. Um, we have a solar system ambassador that says maybe 75,000. Uh, oh, I know I'm going to get this name wrong. Menominee High School, sorry if I, if I didn't say that too well, says three and a half million. Uh, so we've got a lot of three millions over the last 20 years, three and a half million from San Benito High School. Green Park Lutheran is saying, let's see what she had said. I, I, I've lost that answer from Green Park Lutheran, but they also contributed. Lynn Haven says 3 million. Uh, and Corpus Christi School says maybe 500,000. And Hurley Ranch in California, or actually Arizona, they're, they're, they're giving a percentage, about 40%. So we've got a range from anywhere from 40% to 50,000 to 3 million to 3.5 million to 3.8 million. Uh, even uh, Seguin High School says maybe 2 million, so half of them. Gosh, how many images, Kent, do we have from the International Space Station? So I'm surprised a lot of people got it right. Three and a half million images uh, that we have out of our four, over 4 million are from the International Space Station. Uh, which is kind of crazy to think about because you know the first images that we started or missions that we started getting images from was in the early to mid 1960s so it's essentially been 60 years that we've had opportunities to image earth from nasa missions and in just the last 20 years of that so one third of that time we've gotten 75 percent of all of the images that have been collected and there's really one key reason that there's so many images coming from the international space station versus these other missions uh, you, if you think about a space shuttle mission, this is an easy example. Um, for those of you not familiar, a space shuttle mission would launch and then would be in orbit for seven to 10 days, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit less. And it would have a very specific purpose. They'd be launching a satellite and they have to go do all this work to launch the satellite and they'd be very busy for much of that week, week and a half. And so they didn't have a huge amount of time to take pictures of Earth. And then on top of that, we'd only launch, you know, at the busiest years, four to five missions with a space shuttle per year. So that's four to six weeks in space that we could possibly get images of Earth. Compare that to the space station, which has now continuously been operated in uh, on an orbit for uh, since 2000. So it's 20 years that we've had people up there. And it's not just one week out of the year. That is every single day we've got astronauts in the space station for two decades straight. That they have opportunities to look out the many windows we have and take pictures of Earth. And so it kind of starts to make sense when you think about it. They, any time they have free time, a lot of them really love taking pictures of, of Earth. And if you follow any of them on like Twitter or Instagram on, on their official uh, pages, they send out pictures all the time from when they're in orbit of, of the beautiful views they see. And so it kind of makes sense when you think about it, how we've gotten so many photos from the space station. So to give you a little background on the space station, um, this is another picture of it. This is one of my all time favorite photos. And uh, we're kind of cheating. This isn't technically a, a observation of Earth because the space station is the focus, but you can see the Earth and what we call the Earth limb at the bottom. And so uh, this is this is a space station. It's about the size of a football field. And as I said, it's been built up. You know, it started in 2000 and was when it first started being um, uh, inhabited. But it's not just one. We didn't launch one big thing, right? Each part, uh, you know, there's small components and, and compartments that were added over the decades using the space shuttle and other missions to construct this large um, platform and research facility in space. And it, it's up there and orbiting in about 250 miles off, sur off the surface of Earth. Uh, and it orbits the Earth, goes around one time every 90 minutes, so every hour and a half. So basically every one and a half class periods, the, the ISS is orbited around the Earth and is coming back around again. So it does that 16 times a day. So it covers a huge portion of the Earth 16 times a day it's orbiting over. And so there's a lot of opportunities to take pictures of, of the, the planet. And one thing that's really important to highlight with the space station, because this kind of touches on Earth Day, the theme of Earth Day also, is that the space station was only possible with international collaboration. You know, the space station isn't just a NASA program. 
it was, you know, we provided a lot of the, the uh, parts for it, but we worked very closely with our Russian uh, counterparts, with our European counterparts, with J uh, the Japanese, with Canada, with uh, South Koreans. We've got uh, partners from almost every continent now uh, on the International Space Station that have done everything from send astronauts up to build whole sections of it. Uh, and so it's really, truly a collab international collaboration for research, similar to the type of international collaboration we'll need to help combat cl uh, climate change uh, through uh, efforts that uh, environmental protection efforts like Earth Day is promoting. So getting a look on the inside of the space station, this is just a view of a few, few areas within the space station. Uh, my favorite part of the space station is on the left, the, the cupola. And it's this uh, kind of dome-ish area that have all of these windows that the crew can look out at Earth. And that's where a lot of our really good photos come from. And a lot of photos of astronauts in space come from um, because it's such a cool background. And uh, you know, when the astronauts are up there taking pictures of Earth, it's not like they've just got like one camera of these. They have a bunch. You can kind of see it in the middle here. It's a smaller picture, but there's a whole rack of cameras up here. And there are many more that aren't shown in the picture that are used for other things. And uh, when they're taking pictures of Earth, they, they, it's not like your iPhone or your cell phone, right? They have a bunch of different lenses to use because you'll see in a few slides, we ask for a really wide range of types of photos. And so they, they use everything from really small lenses to really, really big lenses to get the kind of images we need. And that's important because you have different research applications and different goals with the types of photos you take. If you think about taking the photo yourself, if you're taking a picture of something on your desk at home and you're really close up to it, you want it really big versus if you're taking a picture of yourself for a portrait, you stand much further away so you can get your whole body in it. It's a similar sort of thing that we're doing when we're taking a picture of Earth. It's sometimes we want a really wide photo of Earth, including so wide that you see the Earth limbs or the horizon of the Earth in the distance, parts of the space station. And that's what you see on this left photo. Uh, using a 16 millimeter lens. So the, and then this is a photo of the California coastline. And I don't blame you for not recognizing it because it's so far zoomed out, it just kind of looks like a large landmass. Well, then you can go into a uh, different lens, like a 50 millimeter lens. And now suddenly you see that middle picture is zoomed in. You don't see the edge of the earth anymore. You don't see parts of the space station. You're, you only see a section of the coastline in California. And then you go to an even bigger lens, like this 400 millimeter lens on the right, and you're zoomed in and that's San Diego. And now you can see the bay in San Diego, you can see the river running through the town, you can see where the, the airport is, you can see a lot more detail. And so these are just, just the different types of scales of photos we have. You think of that blue marble picture encompassing the whole earth, and we'll show you a picture here soon that shows just Venice, Italy. And so it's a wide range that you can take. And it's important to realize, you know, the space station is not the only thing that's up there taking pictures of Earth. If you've ever used uh, Google Earth and you go to the maps and you choose the satellite option, it'll show you pictures of Earth. And you can go look and say, there's my car parked out front or my parents' car, and there's my house or my school. And so there are a lot of other satellites that take pictures of Earth. And not all of them are just taking color photos uh, like you would see on your camera from your phone. A lot of them are taking different types of images to monitor things like rain or lightning or cloud cover or uh, uh, moisture on the surface. And so all of these satellites are up there orbiting and pretty much all of them are orbiting a thing called geosynchronous orbit, which is they're basically much further away than the space station is. And they're designed to do that so that they can cover certain sections of Earth at the same time every day. Because for their applications, they want to get the same kind of picture every day to monitor change over time and to be able to get the best lighting conditions for what they're trying to take picture of. So if they were passing over, trying to pass over a section of Florida to get a picture there, it's basically designed such that every time that they do pass over Florida, it's passing over at noon, so they get the best lighting, for example. So giving you an idea of how the geosynchronous satellites work and the fact that they're trying to take a picture every day at the same time and, and, and using a certain types of, of instruments, what do you think are some of the ways that astronaut photos that are much closer to Earth and have a person behind the lens taking the picture might have over something like a satellite? So as you put your answers in the chat and discuss with the folks that are in your area, again, if you're watching the live stream event on YouTube, discuss with the persons around you. If you're watching the archive, you might pause the video, discuss your answers, and then see what others have come up with. And again, for those of you on the live Zoom event, kind of if you're able to start with your school or org name, we'll give you a little call out. So as we're getting some answers to come in, we've got some answers such as one of our solar system ambassadors from Indiana, I believe, says you can photograph new events right away. Um, another solar system ambassador says astronaut images can be focused on more specific detailed research requests. 
Duxbury says there's a person taking the image. They can see things that a robot or a satellite wouldn't. Uh, let's see, we've got Holy Cross mentions that more specific pictures and better detail if you want them. Otis Field mentions that astronauts can look through the lens to position the camera, get cleaner images, and perhaps even more close-ups. Madison City Schools and their fifth grade group says virtual, uh, to be able to watch for lightning storms um, that might come up out of the blue. San Benito High School says you can monitor perhaps better climate change with astronaut photographs. Downs Elementary says it's helpful to have big overview photo of specific places, as well as that detail. Corpus Christi School says you can get more information about what Earth looks like. And even Lynn Haven says they can get a better angle. Very interesting comment there. Our solar system uh, ambassador, uh, in Virginia says that they can direct the taking of important photos. And even Seguin High School says you can use the ability to take pictures every hour and a half to see the elapsed changes. So we might think about it, uh, does the ISS go over the same location with every orbit or is the Earth orbiting? And maybe Kent, you can say something a little bit about that. And one other that we'll have in here, uh, we've got another solar system ambassador that says, so that they can take even artistic images, showcasing in a sense, the beauty of Earth. So a lot of great answers in there, Kent. What, what do you think? So th there are a bunch of great answers in there and I agree with most of those. And so, uh, you know, one thing that came up that someone mentioned is, is getting a photo every hour and a half of the same area. And I, and I apologize, I should have mentioned, the, the International Space Station orbit does not pass over the same area of Earth every hour and a half. It actually, the orbit uh, shifts based on how the planet is rotating. And so we see a different part of Earth every hour and a half. Now, over a long period of time, multiple weeks and months, we could go back over, you know, if we're going over Italy, it may take us another week or a week and a half before we go over Italy again as the orbit processes through. But, uh, and so we don't go over the same spot every hour and a half. Um, and so that was a good idea. I, I apologize for not clarifying that earlier. Um, but some of the ones I heard in the chat and, and some of the things that you know, we really look for are, uh, one is a variable solar illumination, which is a big fancy word for basically saying different lighting conditions. And so if you think you, you know, if you've taken a picture of yourself, right? If you take it at noon and the sun's right above you, it's very bright and you can see everything great. If you take it at dusk when the sun's setting, there's a lot more shadows, you can't see, you see different details, right? Or if you say, take it at night, perhaps, you know, you may not see yourself at all because it's dark or unless you have a, a light, right? And, and so these are things that actually benefit us when we're taking photos of Earth. Uh, so this is the uh, shoe or boot of Italy. And uh, you can see three different uh, frames from different lighting conditions. And so on the left is probably sometime in the afternoon. Uh, it's very well illuminated. You can see a lot of, uh, of, of Italy itself. On the right is either a, a later in the evening or early morning. So there's less uh, illumination. You can see that the right side is not as, as illuminated as the left side of the picture. And you can see different features pop out in that image versus the left image. And then the bottom is actually one of the, the, the best things that the ISS can provide, and that is nighttime imagery. There are only a few satellites that can actually take nice quality images of the Earth at night. Because most of these satellites, you can't see the kind of, you know, you can't see a mountain range very well at night because it doesn't have a bunch of lights on it. But studying population growth, studying urban growth, studying, uh, you know, urban centers, we all have lights. You've got a light on the outside of your house. You're car that you ride into school or ride to you know to work in has headlights on it the streets have lights and those are things that actually can be tied back to research goals and so nighttime energy is actually one of our biggest requests from researchers and that's something that you can see there uh, on the left and you can see all the lights in Italy another thing I heard someone say is variable look angles and this is really critical um, those satellites that are orbiting Earth that are at a geosynchronous orbit they're much further away and they're designed to look directly it's the term's called nadir um, but it just means they're looking straight down. So if you're sitting at a desk right now and you have an object on the desk, you think of your object. If you lean over and look straight down on that object, right, you're looking later, right? And you're looking straight on the top of it. And so if you think about like, say it's a Coke can or, or some sort of soda, right? You're looking at that. If you're looking straight down, you basically just see that silver top and not much detail about the size of your, of your Coke can. Well, if you only ever get images that way, you don't get to learn everything about it. On Earth, it's not as hard because we, we, we could go to the mountain range in person, maybe. Um, but it's very difficult for a lot of folks to get there, a lot of researchers to go there. And so you want to be able to look at something in different angles, too. And so now if you think about like an astronaut photograph taking images from 
from different angles. So you see this photo of Italy here. These are all different look angles and viewing angles. You could take a wide angle at a low angle and see the side of your hook cam, right? Instead of just straight down. And you can start to see the side of it and see that there's a logo on it. There's you know things on the side. You get a lot of other detail that doesn't show up in those, you know, those just those native viewing images. And so it's not one is perfect and the other isn't. You, it's a complement, right? You want both types of imagery to get a complete picture. And that's something that we can provide that supplements these other types of satellites. And I, I saw um, another answer that said uh, the um, artistic interpretation, which is not something that's con generally considered with imagery, especially from a satellite, but it is very important. A lot of these photos, like the blue marble photo, right, was the crew members realizing what a beautiful image it has and what an impact it could have and taking that picture, right? It wasn't a pure research photo. It was a, it was a humanity, uh, humanitarian photo. It was a photo of the planet thinking, this is a beautiful image of our planet and, and could have a wide impact to, uh, to people back home. And so here's an idea of, of some ways that an astronaut look on that space station looking at, this is Italy again, on the East Coast, uh, looking at a scene and, and understanding what we want for images from them for science purposes or outreach purposes can uh, use the cameras that they have to adjust things like zoom. And so you, you see a really zoomed out picture of Italy here. You can see basically the whole West or Eastern coast. Then you say, okay, well, Italy is up here at the top uh, of the bay and you zoom in and we get a, a different zoom level or a different lens depending on the camera. And you can zoom in, you can kind of start seeing parts of Italy in here, or parts of Venice. You highlight, oh, there's Venice, so let's zoom in a little bit more. And now there's actually Venice right there, I pointed it out. Well, let's get a better zoom in. You can start to see the island of Venice. And now let's get really zoomed in. And you can see the different canals in there. You can see different buildings. You can see the bridges going to Venice. And these are all photos taken by astronauts with different levels of zoom and different uh, uh, lens sizes. And so this is an example of some of the, the interpretation that a person up there can say, well, I'm trying to get this kind of photo. I can change lenses and do this and zoom and get a, and get a better picture than uh, to fulfill what the request was. Uh, and so, you know, these astronauts are up there, and that's Christine Koch in the uh, cupola, and they're they're up there using their unique vantage point to to view Earth. And it's as someone said, uh, you use that uh, intuition that you have as a human to take a photo. If I'm taking a picture of you you know, in front of a tree, a Christmas tree or whatever, I can look at the, take the photo, look at it and be like, mm, I should move a little to the left or I should move a little to the right or I should zoom in more or change the setting to make it look better. And that's something that it's hard to do on a satellite. You take the picture, then you got to download the image and you got to interpret it and then you got to recommand the satellite to do it and hope it's in the right spot still. Well, an astronaut is up there, snap the photo, look at the back of the camera and say, no, I don't like that. I'm going to change this and do, and do it this way. Um, and part of that is, is supplemented by the work that we provide in our group to the astronauts, which is we send them these packets every single day and says, you're going to pass over these places today. You're going to pass over them at this time, exact time today. And it's going to be, you know, this is what we're looking for at this location. And so this is the kind of image we should, we want to try to get. And we factor in things like weather and uh, lighting conditions so that we don't ask someone to take a photo of an area and it's going to be rainy all day. They're not going to be able to see anything because of cloud cover. And so we try to make it as easy for the astronauts as possible. And so our sorts of images um, support science, disaster, educational outreach. Um, you know, you think of uh, science, there's a lot of uh, research in things like change over time, a lot of images, and I'll show you an example of that later um, relating to climate change. Things like urban growth, light pollution. We've got a lot of researchers that use um, images of lights at night as a uh, way to relate growth on the ground of, of new construction. You think you build a new building, everybody puts lights on the outside so that they can see when they're walking out of the building at night. And you can link that to growth on the on the ground level. Also, like I said, disaster response things for fires, hurricanes, uh, you know, earthquakes, everything you can think of. So I've got another question for you. So here's an image. Uh, and this is looking at California, I believe again. What do you see in this image and what do you think this image could support? Science, disaster response, what kind of information do you think you could get from this? So again, for those of you on the Zoom webinar, you can put your answers in the chat area. For those of you watching the live stream, discuss this with the post persons that are around you. And again, for those that are watching the archive, you may perhaps pause and then we'll see what kinds of answers come in. So as we're getting some answers in, thank you very much folks for putting in your uh, school or org, or, or org first. So we've got um, Duxbury that says disasters and you can do fire, um, fire research and look at um, information about that. We have a solar system ambassador from Texas that says you can actually look to where you might need to deploy firefighters. 
Um, we've got a solar system ambassador that says climate effects caused by fires. Uh, we've got another uh, individual that's mentioning that um, change over time based on the fires. And that's one of our solar system ambassadors. We also have Namamani. Oh, I know I get that wrong every time. I'm so sorry. Menominee High School that says meteorology, disaster response and changes in those fires. Um, we also have uh, an individual or a group from Green Park that says the interactions between the clouds and the smoke. And perhaps I can even tell you something about the wind. Uh, we've got another Corpus Christi school that says you can use it to warn people that a disaster is occurring so that they are aware of it. Downs, our group uh, in Delaware says you can send the information to the responders. So again, dealing with disaster response. Otis Field mentions that you can look at in terms of weather and where to also send firefighters. And we have um, Michiana Astronomical Society that says 2A. So um, her, uh, uh, 2A, fires and fire response and even potentially evacuations if they're necessary. MCS and a fifth grade group says virtual disaster response. AX Benavide says environmental effects due to fire. Uh, and also Downs adds in, you can notify people about air quality. Great answers. What do you think, Kent? Those are all really great answers. And, and a lot of them are examples of ways that these images are being used. Uh, you know, we've met with uh, Australian meteorological groups that are studying the, the smoke plumes coming off fires. We've got uh, our own NASA researchers that study that. We've been, uh, you know, these sort of images can help with, you know, locating where a fire is, is and the extent of its smoke cloud and, and how it may affect, like someone said, air quality, how it may uh, interact with nearby uh, fires. And, and so there's a lot of ways that you can use these for, for disaster response and research. So those are some great answers. And so to give you an idea, this, this is another image of a, a, a wildfire that we got. And these images, you know, the astronauts are just not, there's no up or down in space, right? So when they look down at the earth, um, they're just looking at whatever orientation they are at when they take the photo. And so we have to go through and get a, the picture. And on the left is just the, the picture we got from the space station of a fire. And we have to go through and then rearrange the picture by you know, changing the orientation and stretching it and doing as needed so that we can make it align with what we look at when we look at a map. And so I think you can see my cursor here. There's a mount, there's a, a lake right here and another lake right here. And if you look on a picture on the right, we've done a process called georeferencing where we transform it. And there's that lake right there again in the picture and that lake. And so we've figured out, well, we need to twitch like this so that we can line it up and, and put it on a map to provide to somebody. So here's another uh, quick question. Uh, you know, how could you use this image of Turin Italy at night? Uh, would you use it for science, disaster response? What do you guys think? So again, as you are thinking about your answers, chat with those that are around you, think about how you might respond to this, pause your recording if you're watching the archive, and we'll see what kinds of answers come in. And again, start with your school or org name, and right away we've got Namamani High School Urban Growth. Excellent answer there. We also have a solar system ambassador talking about population distribution. One of our other solar system ambassadors says uh, change over time with our urban and rural centers. Otisville says 1C and 1A. So they're looking at that science aspect. Duxbury says change over time, urban growth, light pollution. Lynnhaven says light pollution as well. Uh, our solar system ambassador from Bakersfield says you can actually even look for perhaps traffic patterns and those highways that you might be able to see. Uh, and others are saying Holy Cross says studying light pollution, Sanborn Central says urban growth and light pollution. And we have a Dome on the Go from California. They're saying you can tell the change from perhaps different types of lighting, sodium vapor lighting to LED lighting um, based on coloration. Green Park says where flooding has perhaps affected uh, an area, you might be able to tell from here. Seguin High School says light pollution. In that case, you want to locate a telescope 
telescope to, to look at space. So perhaps right in the middle of the city isn't a great place to view uh, with a telescope right there. We've got all those lights. Uh, two more I'll read. A Corpus Christi Catholic School says change of land over time. And AX Benavide says urban growth and increase or monitoring light pollution. Great answers. What do you what do you think, Kent? There's a lot of great answers there, and a lot of the ones are what this data is used for. Um, some of the the ones that stand out, you know, the light pollution, urban growth are, are very good ones. Um, and and some folks said things like flooding, which is actually uh, interesting because that is something that uh, you can see from these is not specifically flooding, but from res uh, uh, the response from disasters. And so a couple years back when that hurricane hit Puerto Rico, nighttime imagery is compared to pre-hurricane imagery uh, from uh, a satellite. And you could see what areas have lost power um, based on that um, because they weren't lit up at night anymore. And so there's, there's a lot of good ideas there. Um, so now that you've learned a bit about astronaut photography basics, I'm going to go through a couple of quick examples of how we're monitoring change on Earth's surface uh, as it relates to climate change and Earth Day. Uh, and so here's a, a quick question, which is, you, know, you see a couple of climate regions here, and I'm going to cheat and tell you that right down the middle is the Himalayan mountains. And so um, if you're looking at this and thinking of it in terms of the climate and uh, natural environments, what do you see? You know, there's a mountain range in the middle that I just told you about, but how is that affecting the climate and what do you see on both sides of it? So again, this is a very thought-provoking question, and you might be thinking about that and discuss that with your groups if you've got a group of learners with you. Um, and we'll see the types of answers that we have come into the chat on different perhaps climate regions in this area and any support that you might use to describe your observations. So let's see, we've got uh, an answer in there from a solar system ambassador that says a difference in the amount of rainfall or precipitation on the two sides of the mountain range. Um, Down says you can see three distinct regions so great observation. Sanborn Central says three different regions, sort of plains, mountains, and deserts. We've got Michiana Astronomical Society mentioning arid versus fertile regions. One of our solar system ambassadors in Texas says desert and wetlands and mountain regions. Even Duxbury mentions it's probably, uh, to the right is a desert, to the left it seems much more um, wet and moist. Green Park says white is colder snow, brown is drier, less elevation because of no snow. So we have definitely got three zones people are seeing and they've got a lot of amazing information in there. What do you say, Kent? Th those are all great answers because I, you know, I've heard a lot of the stuff that I'm about to show on the next slide, which is you've got uh, kind of three regions here. The Himalayas down the middle, which is the mountain. On the left, I heard a lot of people say fertile, wet, humid. Well, we've got India there, it was a very warm and humid region. And on the right, you've got the Tibetan Plateau, which is very dry. And kind of one of the key things to think about in this picture, and it's, you can kind of see here with the cloud cover uh, and what appears to be like humidity on the left, is that that Himalayan mountains ends up working like a giant wall. And so India is very warm and moist. There's a lot of rain. You think of it a rainforest, you'd definitely be sweating if you're hiking through there. Um, and on the Tibetan Plateau, it's very dry, arid. It does get very cold, but there's not a lot of water or moisture at the surface, so you don't see a lot of plants. And that's because the Himalayan mountains ends up blocking all that moisture from traveling north. And it ends up working as a wall. And so it gets very humid in India. It ends up getting stuck and can't pass the mountains. It rains on that side of the mountains. The rivers flow that water back down into India. And the Tibetan Plateau on the other side stays dry. So a lot of great answers there. So here's another example. Um, what do you guys see here? There's obviously a river running down the middle. How do you really cue into what you see on, on either side of the river and why you think that might be uh, what might be happening there? So again, giving us any of your observations and descriptions and supporting those with why you think you might be seeing what you're seeing in terms of these different regions and what they may be attributed to. So we'll see if we get any answers in the chat and hopefully those of you on the YouTube live stream, you're discussing this as well. And again, if you're watching the archive, you might pause and discuss and then restart the recording. So we've got answers coming in from Sanborn Central that says dry, arid, and wetlands. And then we've got another individual from Otisfield, I believe, that says desert or salt flats and rivers and forests. So kind of the two different zones. Down says there could, in a sense, be three, maybe a little one of one, one of another, and one that's a little bit of a mix. 
One of our solar system ambassadors says perhaps a floodplain to the upper side of the river. Um, Dome on the go from California says higher elevations where it's green above on the right, perhaps. Um, another individual says two regions. Um, another uh, group says desert to the left, wet to the right. So again, thinking about that arid versus more um, um, perhaps precipitation in the area. Green Park says desert and wetland, um, and then a little bit of sort of regular land, if we can say regular land. And Down says dry, vegetated, and there's also that riverbed. So a, kind of a tough one here. What do you say, Kent? There are a lot of good answers there, and one of them really uh, fascinating, hinted on what I'm going to tell you about here, which is I think most people got the, the, the left side is dry, it's the Sahara Desert, um, and the right side is a lot more wet because you can see a lot of plants growing there. It's the Sahel region, which is uh, a boundary region between the Sahara and the mid-latitude rainforests of Africa. And uh, I really want to key on what one group said, though, which is, you know, you've got these big deserts in the Sahara, and, and someone said, or one group said, that there's this appears to be maybe even three groups with like one that's kind of a mix between both. And that is a really good thing to catch because what's happening in this area is the Sahel region, which has more plants and, and, and water, uh, is actually suffering from a thing called desertification, which is a side effect of climate change. And that is where that Sahara desert is encroaching on the Sahel region and drying it out. And that's partially caused by human induced actions at the, at the ground level where they're doing things like cutting down trees to plant more crops. And that ends up making the ground more vulnerable to getting dried out. And so there's a really good thing someone caught there that there's a transition because it's actually happening on the ground. So parts of it are turning from the Sahel, uh, more wet area into a drier area like the Sahara Desert. Uh, and so this next question, so we're running a little short on time. So I'm gonna just tell, tell you what you guys think of this and then we'll move to the last question um, to close up. And so this is uh, an area in Patagonia. And uh, what you can see here in the, the image is there right in the middle is, is a glacier. And this is uh, something that is really important to study uh, when it comes to climate change. And so we, these sort of regions is very mountainous, it's very cold, you've got glaciers. And this is an area that we've been imaging for a long time now. And so I think on the next slide, I should have a sequence of images. And so this is a, a sequence of images of that glacier in Patagonia. And what you can see is that first image on the top left is from 2007, the top right is from 2016, and the bottom left is from 2018. And I'm gonna put my mouse on the screen really quick. Uh, so this is a, a glacial lake here, and right where my mouse is is the end of the glacier and kind of the tip of this little peninsula into the lake. Well, next in 2016, you move over to the right here, that same tip of the, the peninsula right here, you can see how far the glaciers moved back. And then in just two years, from 2016 to 2018, down here at the bottom, you can see that the glacier has moved back even further and it's almost all the way around the corner in just two years from where it was. And that's an important thing to understand is as the world and the earth is warming up, uh, these glaciers are melting at even faster and faster rates. And this is something that you can monitor from uh, the astronaut's photography. And so this is our last question and our last example for the day, which is, this is a region in, in Egypt uh, and there's a lake in the middle. And I kind of want to know what you guys think uh, is going on here. What do you see? There's not, uh, I'm going to tell you now, there's not like different uh, environments. So you're not going to see like a rainforest and a desert on one side. Really want you to key on what's happening to the lake uh, and what do you think has occurred over the last couple of decades? So as you think about putting your answers in the chat, again, think about what you might look for in this particular set of, or this area and how you might use images of it for research. And again, for those of you on the YouTube live, discuss as a group uh, or pause the recording if you're watching the archive. And I am seeing answers come in. I'll read a few right off the bat. We've got Menominee High School, original outline of the lake versus where it might be now. Um, our solar system ambassador, one says that you might look to see if the lake is drying out and even getting smaller. Otis Field says, look to see if you can monitor drought. Uh, Sanborn Central says the lake might be disappearing and you can look at perhaps any decrease in size and where it used to be. Um, we have another solar system ambassador that's talking about evaporation of water from the lake. Holy Cross is thinking it might actually be shrinking as does Duxbury who says you might see where the water was and how it's changing over time. Corpus Christi, the, maybe the lake's drying up and you can see that. Seguin High School, the lake looks like it's drying up just from this one image. 
And Michiana Astronomical Society says maybe with less rainfall, this lake might be shrinking. So many great answers there. Um, and I can't even get to them all, otherwise we'd run way out of time. But these are excellent answers. What, what do you think, uh, Kent? So I think everybody picked up on what I was trying to hint at, right? You, you have this lake in Southern Egypt and you can see that outline, that gray outline. And here is this picture uh, or astronaut photos of this lake uh, since 2001 all the way to 2015. And so you can see, if you can see my mouse, in this top left, that little horn right there is this horn on the right of the lake. And so just 20 years ago, that was filled with water as, were, as was this large lake on the right of the picture there too. And you can go through down the left side and then back down the right side and see over the last 20 years, how that water has disappeared. And that, for example, that large lake on the left or the right side of the top left image is completely gone in that bottom right image in 2015. So just 14 years, that whole lake is gone. And this is really important because what's happening here, some people said evaporation, that's exactly right. You're having evaporation of the water, you're losing it in the lake and reduced and changed weather patterns have reduced rainfall in this area. So there's not enough rain to refill the lake and therefore the water is running out, which is you know, a side effect of the, the climate change that's going on and has negative impacts at the ground level because people use this water for growing crops, for drinking, for feeding to their animals. And when a lake like that disappears in just 15 years, what are you supposed to do if, you're, if your livelihood relies on it? You have to end up moving. And so these are some of the negative side effects that you can monitor from the International Space Station. Um, but this is kind of where I wanna make my last pitch, which is, this is where you can kind of really see the impacts of how the you know, global warming and climate change is affecting Earth and affecting people at the ground level. And so, you know, it may seem really hard for us to tackle climate change, and it is very difficult. There's going to have to be a lot of advancements. But a lot of us in our own personal lives can make choices that help, um, you know, help the Earth and help prevent sort of things like this. And that's through things like recycling, things like reusing, things like not trying to use like one-use plastics, you know, considering your power consumption, turning off the lights and TV when you leave the room. All these things that you can do on your own self that take very little time and can you know, be a contributor to helping prevent climate change and helping uh, fulfill the goal of Earth Day, you know, environmental protection. And so this is the last set of astronaut images I'm going to show you. Uh, and so uh, what you can do after this, if you really want to see some more astronaut images, which I recommend because we have a lot of great ones, is we've got a lot of free available resources um, for for you to use. And this is our website that we run, which is the eol.jsc.nasa.gov. Um, it's the... the it's the uh, Gateway to Astronaut Photography of Earth. If you can't remember that hyperlink, I'm sure if you Google Gateway to Astronaut Photography of Earth, it'll pop up. And that's where you can see all of our images in great collections. Um, and for example, this is a picture of uh, an island in the Caribbean. And you can go and find these images and then download the, the pictures for your presentations, for your education, for your computer background, whatever you want. And on top of that, you can go to NASA's Earth Observatory to read articles based on these images. We have a lot of great articles that give you some of the science and, and what's going on in geography in these pictures, and they come out once a week on top of all the other stuff that they put out at Earth Observatory. And so that's a really good way to access it instead of um, you know, just trying to Google around. You can really see some great stuff there. And so with that, I believe this is my last slide. Um, and so I want to go to questions and, and anything that may not have been answered. Awesome. Well, first of all, Kent, thank you so much for this very powerful and, as many have said in the chat, thoughtful presentation. Um, we have had so many answers that have come in, and hopefully folks that are watching either the archive or the live stream have been able to sort of discuss the rich science that these images can really bring about as well as, you know, um, the thought provoking ideas that you have given them, even about Earth Day and being able to conserve and, and uh, make sure that we're protecting our fragile Earth. So at this time, we have, we are about five minutes to the top of the hour. So what I do want to do is I want to have Andrea and Laura also share their cameras. And um, if we want to be able to go through some questions that have not yet been answered. And I have to say, Laura and um, Andrea did a great job of answering so many of the questions that came in. So thank you, Laura and Andrea. So Ken, I don't know if you want to um, unshare and unshare your slides and then we can focus in on cameras and views of Andrea, Laura, and you. And I'm going to stop my video because I'm um, 
it's not necessary for me to share my video, I don't think, because we want to focus on you guys. So now, five minutes or so left to the top of the hour. And again, for those of you that might need to depart right at the top of the hour, um, thank you for joining us. And we will be in touch with information about the presentation, any additional web links and things such as that. For those of you that want to stay on the line, um, we have an additional 15 minutes or so where we can um, uh, go through some additional Q&A. And Suzanne has also put a little survey in the chat for those of you that might be departing so you can give us some feedback on today's event. Now, before we get into some questions, um, I just want to give Andrea and Laura a chance to sort of say hi and um, uh, introduce themselves very briefly. So Andrea, let's start with you, if you want to say a little about who you are and a little bit about your background. Sure. Paige, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. My, my screen's a little frozen, so I don't see anything moving, but if you can hear me, then that's great. Uh, so my name's Andrea. I'm a geologist with the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Group at NASA Johnson Space Center, and I primarily work with all of the photos that astronauts have taken of Earth. Um, just like all the great examples that Kent showed on our presentation today. And where are you originally from, um, Andrea? Oh, yeah, so I, I'm actually from Houston, and so I didn't have to go too far from home to, to get a nice, um, nice career started here. Awesome, well, thank you. And Laura, how about you? You wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Phoebus, I'm uh, originally from Virginia. Uh, my background is a kind of a mix of environmental science, uh, geology, and GIS. So um, I work very closely with Andrea and Kent and uh, work with um, primarily all the, the photos that the astronauts take um, of Earth from the ISS. Um, so it's pretty great. Everybody asked some awesome questions uh, in the Q&A. So, so that was awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andrea and Laura, for answering the questions in the Q&A area, because it looks like there were at least 20 plus questions that came in that you guys were able to answer. So we so very much appreciate that. And again, Kent, we really appreciate you taking the time to share your passion and your expertise and all this great information. And it does look like there are some additional questions. And folks, if you still have some questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A area. But an early question came in from Otisville, um, Otisfield, and they wanted to know, Kent, what branch of engineering were, did you study and at what college? I studied uh, industrial engineering and systems engineering, which is two uh, weird terms, but it's basically looking at large um, systems, something like the space station, right, that has all these different working components and all these different subsystems that work in them and how to make sure it all works together and actually functions in the end. And so I studied those two uh, at the University of Cincinnati, go Bearcats, um, and then the University of Houston, go Cougars. And then uh, now I'm doing my PhD in geology at Texas A&M, so go Aggies. <laughs> <laughs> so Kent has a, he's got a lot of, uh, of, of great energy, as you can tell. So that blend of engineering and science is also a really great um, blend to have and brings a lot of expertise to things. Um, now, I want to go to actually a few questions that came in um, from the registration forms that weren't in the Q&A area, but a couple of folks had asked some questions. And one of them, uh, an adjunct professor from Florida, and this question may have come up in the already, but I, I think it's worth re-asking. How do astronauts keep images in focus while the ISS is moving so quickly using these long focal length lenses or really any lens? Do you want me to answer that or uh, I don't know if? Yeah, we'll start with you and then we'll see if Andrea and Laura has anything else to add to that. Okay, could you repeat the question? I apologize. I was typing an answer in the chat. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. So they want to know- I was doing the same thing, Paige. <laughs> how can these astronauts, you know, how are they able to keep these images in focus when the ISS is moving so quickly, especially with long focal lenses? So Kent, we'll start. So with you. that's actually it's okay. Uh, so it's actually really challenging, um, and that's something you know when you think about you see the images we show on our database of, of Earth. Uh, that's a list of 
good images, right, that we actually get uh, from the astronauts. And just like if you're trying to take a picture out of your car or anything like that, there's a lot of images that are really out of focus or not great that we don't, you know, usually put in presentations because they're all blurry. Um, but it is definitely a challenge and has to do with a lot with the training um, that folks like Andrea and Laura provide to the astronauts on how to take a good image from, from the space station. Um, you know, when they're in the space station, it doesn't feel like they're going really fast because everything with them, it's like you're in a car, right? You don't feel like it unless you look out. Um, but the earth is so far away compared to the road outside your car, so you don't notice it as much. Um, but there is a lot of effort into teaching them how to, to um, stay still and, and take a good image. And, I, and I'll let Andrea, because she's, she's got a lot of experience training the astronauts on this sort of stuff, uh, chime in. Sure. So one technique that astronauts will do is they'll actually, so pretend I'm like holding a big camera lens, they'll actually move with the target. So they'll, they'll kind of move and make sure they're following the target as they take a picture. And so that's, that's one technique. And sort of related to that, maybe I'll ask Laura this question. When you're asking the astronauts to take an image, do you actually make recommendations on whether they should use a long lens or a shorter lens? So we'll leave that one to Laura. Sure, um, absolutely. Um, it depends on um, what they're looking at, what type of target. Um, if it's a really small um, point on Earth that we want them to take a photo of, we'll ask them to choose a higher focal length so you can get a really zoomed in high resolution photo of that uh, of that image. And would you say, and this is for any of you, is it harder to use a longer a focal length versus a shorter focal length, if I phrase that correctly? Sure, I can take one. Um, it's a lot harder for the astronauts to um, hold a longer lens, a longer focal length, because that's a, a, a bigger lens. Uh, oftentimes, it's, it's heavier. Um, so they have to kind of um, use a little more effort to control the, the whole camera system while they're trying to take a photo in space. Awesome. Well, thank you for that question. And again, that came from uh, um, one of our folks in Florida. So here's another question that I see in the chat or in the Q&A area. And one of our folks wants to know, can you see the Northern Lights from space? So maybe Kent, we'll, we'll throw that one over to you and anyone else. Yes, actually, and I don't have the presentation up anymore, but the very opening slide I had uh, with the title on the Observing Earth actually was a photo of the Northern Lights. And we have a really great collection on our website of images of the Northern Lights um, that the crew can see. It's one of the most spectacular things that they remark about when they're on ISS is just how well you can see them and how bright they are. Excellent. Well, you know, here's a question from Campbell Middle School, and they're studying rocks in class right now. So, you know, Andrea, you mentioned that you are a geologist. So what is your favorite part of being a geologist and how did you start your career in that field? So that one's for Andrea. Sure. Um, yeah, it'll be a little easier to say it than to type it. So um, I like being a geologist because it's it's like being an earth detective. You can use rocks, um, you know, out in the world. You can find out their chemistry to extract information. And then you can start to figure out how those rocks formed and why um, not just rocks, but why mountains exist, why um, ocean basins exist. You know, there's a lot of clues in the chemistry and um, the way the rocks are layered and such, um, depending on how they form. It, it's just fascinating to me because you have to use the clues you're given at the surface or maybe the lack of clues to figure out um, the past and use that to anticipate uh, changes in the future. Um, how did I start my career in this field? I did a bachelor's uh, in geology at the University of Houston. And then I did my master's in geology at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And from there, um, my first job out, out, of, um, out of school was working here um, in the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Group. So that's my, that's my story. Awesome. And you know, it's so interesting for Campbell Middle School, you know, all rocks have a story to tell. And one of the other things that we do at our facilities here at the Johnson Space Center is we curate all of NASA's astromaterial samples. And that includes moon rocks, meteorites, like Kent mentioned, meteorites, 
And all those rocks locked up in those rocks, they all have a story to tell. And so the rocks don't lie and uh, learning how to be able to read them so you can get that story out of them is such a fascinating thing to do. So we're so glad that you're studying rocks because um, we are the home of rocks from space. Um, here's another question that came in from our registration folks. Um, they were wondering what kind of formats are the images available in? Are they in FITS files, JPEGs, PNGs? How, how, what kind of files are available? Sure, so at our website, the Gateway to Astronaut Photography of Earth, uh, where we host all of these astronaut photos, uh, they can be downloaded as JPEGs of various resolutions. And then um, for most ISS imagery, you can also download the raw camera file, which is a .NEF file. Awesome, thank you very much. As I scan the Q&A here, let's see. Here's a question and they're wondering in terms of zoom, the zooming that's available with these cameras and lenses, up to what type of resolution can they, can the astronauts see? So for example, can they see a vehicle? Can they see an airplane? What can they see from the International Space Station with the, the sort of zoom capabilities depending on their lenses? So those that the resolutions that we get out of the images are um, variable, right? So it depends on uh, atmospheric conditions. It depends on uh, blur within the image. Um, but our, I'd say, our absolute best images, our clearest ones that we get that have you know very little um, issues with transmission through the atmosphere, uh, end up getting down to three and a half meters per pixel. Is generally, um, which means uh, you. Seeing a car, so you think one pixel in an image is three and a half meters, a car is probably five meters, right? So it, it can be kind of tricky to see a car. You may be able to see a blob in one pixel as a car, but um, it, it gets tricky at the really small resolutions. And so uh, it's pretty similar to a lot of the, the um, publicly available uh, satellite imagery also. There's not much that's publicly available that gets higher resolution um, than that three and a half meters. Um, there are expensive private stuff that you can buy for many, many thousands of dollars to get better. Um, but one of the benefit of our stuff is it's free. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that answer. So we've got a question here um, of someone who has had a friend who's actually perhaps been on shuttle flights before. And this individual is wondering how much astronaut training time is on the photography. Uh, and this individual said his, the friend that they had that uh, that flew um, did have a lot of photography training, but can you tell us a little bit more detail on that? Sure, I'll handle that one. So uh, there are lots of different groups train astronauts on lots of different topics. Um, our group specifically will train astronauts on different earth science topics, as well as uh, what kind of imagery we would like them to take that we can use for our science requests. Um, as for actual camera use training, that is a different group. Um, but otherwise, uh, each astronaut assigned to an ISS mission goes through a series of um, just short lectures that uh, we talk with them about different earth science topics. And that sounds like a really fun thing to, to, to have to do to, you know, you look at the earth anytime, you know, I see images of earth, they're just so stunningly beautiful. And, you know, that research aspect or just the beauty of earth from space is, is absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure it helps people learn a lot of geography as well. The more you're looking at these areas, the more you learn them um, and get to see what they are. Now here's a question from uh, Challenger Learning Center in Tennessee. And they're wondering, are the astronaut photographers all experts in geography or do they use other tools to sort of help them in finding their targets? I can answer that one. Um, so no, I, you know, our, the astronauts are all very, very smart, but the important thing to understand as an astronaut is they have to know how to do Pretty much everything when they're in space because they're their plumber they're the electrician they do all of the work on the space station to keep it working on top of running science experiments on top of keeping in shape and on top of taking pictures of earth and so if you think about trying to manage all of that at very high levels it can be difficult and so 
um, we provide training to them and some of them are and we do have astronauts that are geologists that are really full in experts on, on geography and earth observation um, but a lot of them are engineers or come from engineering backgrounds and uh, they are very open and interested in learning geography and those are the classes some of the classes we provide them but on top of that we have tools that are on the space station that help them out and so those daily messages we send to them where we say well you're going to be over this part and look this way at this time to get your picture you need and also there's things that there's a tool uh, that's up there that's kind of like uh, Google Maps. It's not Google Maps, but it's kind of like that that shows where the, the, the ISS is and where it's going to be and what they're going to fly over. So they can say, oh, I'm going to fly over Africa later today. And they know that and they kind of can see where they're going to be going. And they'll have an idea of when they look out this window, they know at least that they're looking at Southern Africa. So they have a general idea of where to, to, to peak to try to take a picture. Excellent. Now, I think I have one or two more questions that I'll uh, pose to the group here. And one of them, this uh, uh, question comes in from one of our participants and they're wondering, are there any specific image processing programs that you use often or that are preferred when you're working with these astronaut photographs? Andrew or Laura, you guys do a lot of that work. <laughs> do you want an answer? Um, I, I guess I won't say image processing specifically, but we, we do use a variety of software um, like GIS software or um, kind of different photo editing files for um, different reasons. And some of those can but even the be photos on our website are unedited, the ones that are available. And that's, that's great to know, um, because as you do look at some of those images, you might look look at an image and say, oh, that looks a little dull in color. And that's because the images that they do put up, they're unprocessed uh, so that folks can sort of see them in, in the raw, so to speak, and then be able to um, do any processing they may need to do as part of their research. Um, and I, I would you say, Andrea, that um, there's also some in-house tools that are developed that you all use as well? Uh, yeah, we have some in-house tools. Uh, it's not really for not really for manipulating photos, but for um, kind of doing our daily messages and operations that um, we create the maps for and such that astronauts use to take photos from. Excellent. Well, in our last couple of minutes, I have a question that maybe we'll start with Andrea, then go to Laura, and then end with Kent. Um, and the question is, you know, for the um, individuals out there, especially some of our younger folks that may be looking for their future STEM careers, do you have any advice or thoughts on what they should think about doing um, as they pursue perhaps a STEM career in the future? So any career advice? Andrea, let's start with you. Sure, if you find a science, technology, engineering or math topic that really interests you, don't, don't be afraid to find out more. Um, it, it's really intriguing and inspiring to discover new information and find out what really interests you. Um, you know, it could lead to picking an interesting college degree and ultimately a cool job along the way. Um, so yeah, don't, don't limit yourself with, with your, your STEM interests. It's, um, you know, there's endless possibilities in where your career and life could take you. Awesome, thanks, Andrea. So Laura, we'll, we'll go to you. What kind of STEM career um, advice do you have for the variety of folks on the line? Sure, I would, I would definitely, um, you know, agree with everything Andrea said. I would, I would also say that, you know, if you find something um, in a STEM field, um, science, technology, even engineering, a, a math topic that you're really passionate about, um, you know, as, as long as you are, are really persistent and, and find something that, you know, you're, you're really passionate about, um, you know, you can, there, there are endless possibilities um, nowadays for STEM um, studies and you never know uh, what path that could take. Um, I, I wasn't, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was in school, but I found, um, I took an intro to geology class and I um, got really passionate about environmental science. And, um, you know, after college that, that opened up some doors for me to work here at Johnson Space Center and work with astronaut photography. 
Awesome. Thank you, um, Laura. And, you know, she said one of those sort of key words that you can't say enough if you're passionate about it. You know, I've said in many of our previous webinars, if you're passionate about what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And I truly believe that. And so, um, so we've now gotten Andrea's perspective and Laura's perspective. And so now we'll go over to Kent. Any, any career uh, sort of advice for folks or any closing remarks as we bring this to a close in the next few minutes? Over to you, Kent. I just want to echo what Andrea and Laura said, which is uh, you need to find something that really interests you. And I know a lot of the folks on the call are, are younger uh, than you know college aged, but you you know you get thrown into college and they're like, all right, choose something that you want to do for the rest of your life. Um, and it can be difficult. And I've met a lot of kids that are like, I want to work at NASA, so I'm going to be an aerospace engineer, even even though they don't end up liking aerospace engineering and they, they don't do well in class because they're not interested in it. And and so you really need to find that one field or that one topic or that thing that really gets you going that you really are excited to study. And you know, myself, I changed majors three times in college. I was an astrophysics major. I was an aerospace engineering major. I went to systems engineering. I moved around um, until I found something that I really liked. And I promise you, you know, so many people think that you need to be like one. There's like one or two things that you can do to work at NASA, for example. We have every single type of STEM-related career. I know people work that are mathematicians, physicists, chemists, doctors. Every type of engineering you can think of, geologists, computer scientists, computer program, anything in STEM related, and you can work in a field like NASA, with NASA or any of the other STEM fields. And so it's really just most important that you find the thing that really gets you going, really um, that you're really passionate about. And so then, then you can focus on it, do a good job at it, and, and become an expert at it and get a job um, working in those sort of fields. Awesome. Well, and with, with that, um, uh, we are about 17 minutes past the top of the hour. And again, I want to especially take a moment to thank Kent and Andrea and Laura for taking the time out of their very busy day to share the work that they do with astronaut photography, especially Kent for asking us all those really thought provoking questions. So thanks for getting us thinking out there. Thanks for joining us. And to all of you that are still on the line or that are listening to the archive, we're so happy to have shared the work that these folks do on a daily basis. And we hope that you've gotten a whole lot to think about. We hope that you enjoy Earth Day and celebrate our Earth um, and think about Earth from space and all the astronaut photography that these folks work with on a daily basis, as well as with the astronauts. So with that, again, thank you so much. Again, thank you, Kent especially, and Laura and Andrea, and Kim and Suzanne as well. And lastly, but certainly not least, to our ASU team and folks in Finiscope and, and uh, Sina, thank you so much for hosting our event, streaming it live, and we look forward to sharing um, the archive with all of you out there. So with that, we'll officially bring this to a close. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great rest of April and happy Earth Day next week. <laughs>